Hi folks, welcome to the sixth video in the continuing expedition into the family history of the Moffats. The family tree currently looks like this. And so we now come to the 1891 census. And apart from Mary and Thomas Mackintosh, everyone seems to have disappeared. There are no suitable or easily discoverable candidates for Margaret, John, James, Isabella or Catherine with the surname Moffat, living in Jarrow or having been born in Carlisle. So, apart from head scratching, this suggests that maybe a change of tack is required. So perhaps we can begin with Catherine and speculate that maybe she has changed her name. Maybe she is now Cathy or Kate. A search of the 1891 census for a Kate Moffat reveals a likely candidate who is the domestic servant for Henry Pritchard, a merchant tailor. According to the census entry, she was born in Jarrow and is aged 15, so therefore born in about 1876. So she's now living in 16 Belgrave Terrace, Westgate, Newcastle upon Tyne. This may well be our Kate. So one down, several to go. So let's think about Isabella. She would be in her 20s in the 1890s, so she may have married. A search of the BMD index reveals that an Isabella Moffat married a Henry Curtis on the 27th of February 1891, and so just before the 1891 census. Henry Curtis was 35 years old and a seaman in the Royal Navy. Isabella was 25 years old living at 13 Herbert Street, Newcastle. Both fathers are deceased and while Mary's father is recorded as George Moffat, she gives his occupation as a joiner, which is the same as what James recorded on his marriage certificate. Although, as you may remember, James records his father's name as John. It can also be noted that on the marriage certificate, Henry is a widower. So this marriage to Isabella was probably his second. And we can see that on the same marriage certificate, one of the witnesses is recorded as James Moffat, who would have been 20 years old at this time. Therefore, we now know that James was in Newcastle about five weeks before the census, which was taken on the 5th of April 1891. A search for Henry and Isabella Curtis in the 1891 census draws a blank, but the 1901 census reveals Henry and Isabella Curtis living at 166 Frank Street, Benwell, Newcastle upon Tyne. They have two sons, John H, aged 19, so therefore born around 1882, and Sydney, aged three, so born around 1898. This would mean that Isabella is the mother of Sydney, but not John H. Perhaps the most useful detail is that the census entry reveals Henry was born in Devonport, Devon, and this allows us to locate him in the 1891 census. He is aboard the HMS Wallaroo as the chief stoker, aged 37, so born around 1854, and is recorded as being married and from Devonport, Devon. As an aside, HMS Wallaroo was a Pearl class cruiser built by the Tyneside shipbuilder Armstrong Whitworth for the Royal Navy and was originally named HMS Persian. The ship was launched on the 5th of February 1890, so three weeks before Henry and Isabella got married. However, the ship was renamed Wallaroo on the 2nd of April 1890 as part of the Auxiliary Squadron of the Australia Station and she arrived in Sydney with the squadron on the 5th of September 1891. A search of the Royal Navy Registers of Seamen's Services 1848 to 1939, which is not easy to say, on the Ancestry.co.uk website allows us to see Henry Curtis's service record. We can see that he was on the HMS Wallaroo from the 31st of March to the 4th of November 1891, followed by three years on HMS Orlando and a final three months on HMS Pembroke. 
Meanwhile, a search for Isabella Curtis in 1891 draws a blank. Since Henry was on a ship on its way to Australia, is it possible that Isabella travelled out there as well? Something to add to the list for future research. Meanwhile, given that Henry was born in Devonport and born around 1854, this allows us to locate him in the 1881 census, where we find he is married to Elizabeth, living at 20 Martin Terrace, Stoke Damerel, Devonport. They are 27 and 24 years old respectively, Elizabeth having been born in Cornwall. According to the 1901 census, John H was born in Devonport around 1882, and a search of the GRO index reveals a John Henry Curtis born in the fourth quarter of 1881 to a Curtis and Stevens. Knowing this allows us to locate a marriage of a Henry Curtis and an Elizabeth Stevens on the Ancestry.co.uk website in the fourth quarter of 1880 in Stoke Damerel. However, I've yet to locate John H in the 1891 census, and there are no obvious candidates in searching for the death of Elizabeth Curtis. However, it may be possible to use Henry's service record as a starting point, so that's on the to-do list as well. In the 1911 census, Isabella and Henry, who is now a crane man and naval pensioner, they are living at 170 Frank Street, Benmore, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, with their son Sidney, now aged 13. If we go back to the marriage certificate of Isabella Moffat and Henry Curtis, we can see that the registered address for Isabella is 13 Herbert Street. In the 1891 census, this house is occupied by Thomas and Margaret Kirk aged 63 and 49 respectively, Margaret having been born in Carlisle, along with their two sons William aged 6 and Thomas M aged 10. Which leads to the question, who is this Margaret Kirk? Is this the Kirk connection mentioned by Great Aunt Winnie? There are several lines of inquiry, but the most fruitful turned out to be the birth of William Kirk, who is recorded in the 1891 census as being born about 1885. A search of the GRO index reveals that William Kirk was born on the 5th of May 1894 to a Thomas Kirk and Margaret Kirk, late Moffat, formerly Armstrong. Consequently, the suggestion of remarriage is confirmed, which then raises the question, when did Margaret remarry? A search of the BMD index prior to the birth of William and after the 1881 census does not reveal a marriage for a Thomas Kirk and a Margaret Moffat, or indeed Margaret Armstrong, prior to 1884. However, following a suggestion by Colin Moffat, who maintains the database for the Clan Moffat website, it transpires that Thomas and Margaret actually got married in 1901 some 20 years after they began living together. As Colin suggested, after living together for some 20 years, Margaret began to think of her safety and security if Thomas died first. As unmarried to him, she would be vulnerable to his children, who might even turf her out of the family home. As married, she'd be able to use the family home for the duration of the rest of her life. The marriage certificate has Thomas and Margaret married on the 6th of April 1901, which is just a week after the 1901 census was taken. Is it possible that in talking to the enumerator, Thomas and Margaret realised they needed to formalise their partnership, as suggested by Colin? However, the marriage certificate does throw a spanner in the works of who Margaret really is. She is a widow and she's aged 59, so born around 1842 to 3. But her father is recorded as Hugh Houlihan, deceased, a private in an infantry regiment. This compares with Margaret's marriage certificate to George Moffat, where her father is recorded as Hugh Armstrong, 
but with no recorded occupation. In the meantime, there is no birth registered for a Thomas Kirk around 1881, but it turns out that a Thomas Moffat was born on the 19th of November 1880 to Margaret Moffat of 29 Chater Street, Jarrow, but the birth certificate has no father's name. Since George Moffat died 17 months earlier, who might be the father? And there is then another question. Why is Thomas Moffat missing from the 1881 census? He would have been about five months old at the time. And is it possible that Thomas was named after his father, Thomas Kirk, and that Thomas Kirk and Margaret Moffat subsequently decided to live together? But returning to the Moffat family, as to Margaret's son John, a search of the BMD index reveals that on the 6th of June 1886, John Moffat of 13 Back Herbert Street died of phthisis, a wasting disease he suffered from for three months. And this was in the presence of his mother, Margaret Kirk. This would be another confirmation regarding the identification of Margaret Kirk as originally Margaret Moffat. Although Isabella is still missing, we do know she's now married, but we still have James unaccounted for in the 1891 census. We do know he was at his sister's wedding in February of that year, but he is nowhere to be found in, that, in the census that was taken a few weeks later. However, we do know that James married Mary Lydia Lackenby in December 1892, so the question we have is what was a 21 to 22 year old James doing for those 21 months? And we still have the question, why did James record his father as John Moffat? Although both he and Kate recorded their father as being a joiner. We can also speculate that the date on James's pocket watch of 1901 marks the marriage of James's mother and that the watch originally belonged to his brother John. And maybe it became a gift. Perhaps it was a peace offering between stepfather and stepson. An interesting thought. Unfortunately, according to a letter written to me in 1993 by his granddaughter, my Auntie Joyce, my father's sister, James became an alcoholic. So he may have had his own demons to cope with. Sadly, my grandfather, James Lackenby, according to my aunt, never really spoke to his father because his father had spent all his wife's money on drink, that is, Mary Lydia's money. I have a feeling that James Moffat's life was not an entirely happy one. We can now update the family tree with these new details. Meanwhile, search parties will be dispatched at some point to continue the various lines of inquiry still to be resolved. Meanwhile, in the next video, we will be finding out what happened to Kate Moffat.